coming to you from the Vatican. This is Pope Francis here to issue a new papal encyclical. From now on, all Catholics must listen to the Clean Energy Show with Brian and James. And further to that, I now announce that I am the new co-host of the show. Now roll the, the theme song. Hello and welcome to episode 182 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Whittingham. This week on the show, Pope Francis lambasts fossil fuel companies for greenwashing and destroying the climate. He also came out against abortion, infidelity, and listening to podcasts on the subway. Sorry, Terry. A power utility in Vermont is planning to install batteries in the homes of their customers. Their plan would completely eliminate power outages by 2030 said other power utilities, hey, you're making us look bad. Ireland turns down a new liquefied natural gas port on the basis it would be bad for the climate. Ireland has also banned our Irish listener Sean from complaining about the lack of AI voices in last week's episode. This week, a news story answers a question we had from last week's show. Can wind turbines work in the far north? The answer will surprise you. No, that's a lie. It won't surprise you at all. Of course they can. All that and more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. The race between climate change and the deployment of clean technology is on. The Clean Energy Show gives you a front row seat to the latest developments. And also this week on the show, EV tax credits to become an instant rebate in the United States. Are robo-taxis making progress? And EVs are cleaner than combustion vehicles, even if your grid is powered by 100% coal. Yes, and of course, the big news for this week, our new co-host for the show, Pope Francis, has taken time out of his uh, busy schedule of uh, blessing things and, you know, Pope duties to uh, be the co-host on the show. So thank you very much, uh, Pope Francis, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me to co-host the show. I'm kind of like the third Beatle. Yeah. Third Beetle, Your Holiness. Kind of like the Third Beetle. I mean, we'll always think of them as, as the First Beetle, but, you know, thank you. Uh, or Ringo, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. On to the banter for this week. This is a segment called Storytime with Grandpa. I don't think we made a theme song for this. I think... Uh, well, we got some music here. <laughs> Excellent. Story time for Grandpa. I think we had this segment one other time, story time with Grandpa. And I'm not a grandpa, but every time I tell a story like this, I just feel so incredibly old. But <laughs> I bought a new hard drive the other day. Oh, it's a, Grandpa buys a hard drive. <laughs> it's a single unit and it's 20 terabytes. Whoa. And that just made me think about, see, I've got all this data, like, you know, making films for many years and taking photographs for many years. I've got, you know, several terabytes of data that I kind of need to back up and keep in case I ever uh, need something. So I could get them all on one drive, this big 20 terabyte hard drive. But it just got me to thinking the very first hard drive that I bought was in 1989, and it was 20 megabytes. Well, that... uh... 20 megabytes. Okay, that... You were quicker to computers. You're a bit older than me, and you're quicker to computers (laughs) because... Mine was 96 when I bought one through work. Yeah. And it, I maxed out the $2,600 and I got a two gig hard drive, which was so big at the time. Wow. That's enormous. They had to partition it on Windows to be two one gig drives because this operating <laughs> system could not handle uh, that. Yeah. Well, this is not, was not 20 terabytes. This is 20 meg. We've already used more than 20 megabytes. That's just right. Our shows are about 56 this. megabytes uh, <laughs> at 128 stereo. So, yeah, for the final show. But, Anyway, so just, I don't know, can you do the math in your head really quickly? How big is that 20 megabytes compared to 20 terabytes? And this was 1989 that I got that hard drive. So do, do you know the math on that? Now, trillion? Billion? It's, it's a million. It's a million, a million times bigger. A million times bigger. Okay. The hard drive I was... that I bought in 1989 and the one I bought this year And I bet now... it was pricey. What was, do you remember the price of the 89 oh, hard drive? Eight, $800 for the 20 oh. megabyte drive. <laughs> How much was this one? In, Half in that? $1989. This one was 600 Oh, really? Yeah. So it's, so, kind of, it's cutting edge then, probably the biggest hard drive there is, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's uh, it seems like it. And of course, when you adjust for inflation, that, that $800 in 1989 would be probably double that. 
Right. So, uh, it would. I just, I couldn't believe it. Wow. <laughs> Well, you know, this ties into what we talk about because there's all these uh, learning curves of the technology we discussed, solar, wind, uh, batteries. uh, They all improve like your hard drive did. Yeah, and I was kind of an early adopter. I mean, I don't think they sold a lot of 20 megabyte hard drives. It wasn't until a couple of years later that hard drives were even common. Uh, Speaking of technology, uh, my air purifier, okay? Very happy with it. You know why? It's because every time I spray Windex across the house, it goes off. It it senses oh the Windex. God. Really? Yeah. It, like it's it's smart. Oh. And I I, I want to take it outside when the refinery is stinky. I'll need an extension cord, but I want to make a little video yeah. going outside. Like it's inside, fine. I open the door, take it outside. It'll turn. There's so two turn levels of bad. Off. There's purple and red, and yeah. it will uh, it'll turn purple or red. And just kick up the fan automatically. So that's really amazing. And it was $200 on sale. And just w- using Windex in the house will turn it on. Yes, Windex. I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to get someone to flatulate in front of it to see if that turns it off. We haven't, you know, had the timing right for that yet. For cleaning windows, I use a microfiber cloth and water. So maybe you don't need the Windex. Why would you do that? It works. Clean- you don't need the Windex. Really? Yeah. What happens now, if there's grease on there, like fingerprints? My kids still. Yeah, are very touchy. That's fine. It's got to be a clean microfiber. Now, of course, microfiber cloths might be bad for the environment too, because we have all these microplastics in our environment. So, I, you know, I'm not sure it's a better answer, but that's what I use is a microfiber cloth and water. Tips with Brian. There's all yeah. kinds of them. He does things differently, kids. He thinks outside the box. It's uh, probably a reason in itself to listen to this podcast. If uh... This is fun, guys. Thank you for letting me be here. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, it's yeah. good to have you here. It's nice to have good three to have people you. on the show, even if one of them is yeah, elevated on a different level. Oh, I got my dongle in the mail, my mysterious dongle for my um, my p- power utility uh, EV program, which they're going to yeah. rebate me some money for charging at night. And yeah. it was, in fact, a dongle. And I didn't know that. There was no instructions in the package. It's just this giant dongle, which is heavy and deluxe because it works mm-hmm. on a cellular network with GPS built in. But I haven't got it working yet, so that sucks. But So you might need some help. But So this is how the power utility can track when you charge your EV and how much power you use so they can get the data. And yeah, it's, uh, I, I forget what the program is called, but it's there's several utilities, not a lot of them, but several utilities across North America are participating, and hopefully more will too. So yeah, I'm hoping to get that down. Um, I want to get it uh, going and working, but the, the, the support on it is just terrible. It's just a, you know, the website doesn't work. It's crudely made. It's just eh, it's stupid, but I want my six cents per kilowatt hour back. Plus yeah. all the fees I get for participating. It's like 10 bucks a month or something. It's nice. It's sweet. A $25 or something, you know, starting fee, which if yeah. anybody out there locally who is doing this knows, give me a, a DM about this. Cause I, I can't get the thing working on my Chevy Bolt EV, but I want to. So for, it's as they say, by the way, it's for a couple of years, at least, which could be extended. So that's nice. And by then we might have time of day pricing where I could charge it at night and save money anyway, which I'm hoping we'll get sooner or later. You know, by the way, I watched Electric's uh, video they made on the Waymo self-driving robotaxi in Los Angeles, and I was really impressed. It went through completely ridiculous stuff, like yeah. just insane. And I know Tesla... It's been a long time. It's been 18 months since you and I did our little test together. But I, I know that Teslas would not be able to handle this. Okay. They, they wouldn't handle any aspect of it. But it was very good. It saw all the cyclists. There was a person rolling a washing machine across the street at one point. It was like ridiculous. <laughs> you know, like you talk about all the edge cases. Well, you probably never would have thought of a washing machine rolling across in front of you. But that was one of the situations and all kinds of construction and the narrowing of paths. And when they got dropped off at Venice Beach, they actually, I, I noticed the car will, if it's not confident, it will follow other cars, but some other car made an illegal entry into a place that it shouldn't have went. And then I got stuck mm-hmm. there and that's where they got out anyway, but then it was stuck there blocking traffic for a moment. And that's kind of the, the big issue with them is not crashing, but just blocking traffic. Uh, yeah. So, you know, a human had to take over from remote control, uh, look at the situation where it was and then slowly get it out of there so that's kind of the situation but i think it's progressing brian and i think that uh you know 
once they get the hiccups of blocking traffic out of the way, and some of it's technical, like just losing contact with the home base or a computer crashing, then it's going to be um, taking off pretty quick. Not, It's not going to be 10 years from now. Yeah, that's uh, kind of amazing. Quick, quick progress. Okay, so on to our first story. This is from Vermont in the United States, and the story comes from the New York Times. There is a small power utility in Vermont called Green Mountain Power, and they're asking regulators to let them buy batteries to install in their customers' homes. So this is part of their plan to revamp the grid, make it uh, safer, cheaper, and to fight blackouts. But instead of doing it the way other utilities are doing it, they're like, hey, why don't we just put the batteries in the customers' homes? Uh, Which I think is a pretty cool uh, idea. Now, it is a smaller utility. They have only 270,000 homes and businesses in their area that they serve. So, you know, that does make it a, a different kind of case. But they just did the math and they figured out that Yes, they're going to continue to upgrade the power lines and they're going to continue to bury them. And they had a lot of severe weather this year, so they had a lot of blackouts from uh, storms and whatnot. But they did the math and it would just be cheaper than building new lines and new power plants. And of course, we know about grid storage batteries. And this is, again, something that's that's really coming online. You can get several you know, megawatts. So uh, the grid utility can have a little kind of you know, battery farm uh, but they're partly because it's so small, I think they're just, no, let's just put them in the homes. And I think this just, it makes so much sense because this is something customers normally do on their own, right? Like lots of people are buying batteries and putting them in their homes because it can give you power when the power goes out. And depending on the district, you can make money from it by selling your power back to the grid when power is needed either just individually or, you know, Tesla's running virtual power plants where they kind of run a whole bunch of these sorts of things. So if you think about it, the goals really are the same as what a utility would have if you buy a battery for your house. Well, utilities, they need to avoid blackouts and they want to make money from selling power. So why wouldn't they do this? In a way, they're kind of giving up the business. If they're letting all of us just buy our own batteries, we're letting, you know, they're letting us take over the power business. So they're trying to, you know, head this off at the pass and say, okay, decentralized power is the future. So if we get into this now, then we can be the ones that can own it and control it and, you know, make money for it. What a stark difference between, uh, you know, grids like ours, which are behind the times and not realizing this. And a really progressive grid that gets it in Vermont. Yeah, that's very interesting. You know, I mean, what sense would it make for a lot of grids to say, okay, they should have a program like they have for our EV rebate here to say, okay, well, let's get 50 people in this entire province of a million point two people, 1.2 million people and try them out, uh, strategically place them different places and, you know, just, uh, balance the grid or just see how it works and then and then go from there maybe expand it because yeah we have a lot of power outages here yeah it's it's kind of dumb but anyway if they're able to implement this plan they still need kind of permission from uh, the government but they think that this will make them you know virtually eliminate blackouts by 2030 and it makes sense if everyone has a battery in their home the fact that it eliminates blackouts by 2030 by doing this is remarkable in itself like because the for the utilities like these batteries probably aren't a huge expense as far as things go and and think about how happy the customers will be to have a a, a power backup yeah no compared to building a power plant or building a long-range transmission line are they only doing it with people with solar by any chance or is it just anybody can do it they're they're planning to do it with anybody uh they have had a program already in place where you would lease like a tesla power wall from them so they've they have done this to some extent where they've facilitated it but this is kind of a, a sort of a different thing and the power in this area of the united states is higher cost than uh normal so that is part of what makes it viable i think is right. that when you know when you've got expensive power in a place that this kind of thing uh, totally makes sense i would like to bless green mountain power in vermont for this clean green energy initiative i honestly thought that moment was a bit of a dump but this changes everything it does it does yeah. your holiness it, it really does yes. I, I might have said the same thing well and speaking of the pope from nbc 
Pope Francis, our co-host this week, have made his strongest statements yet about climate change on Wednesday. He rebuked fossil fuel companies and urged countries to make an immediate transition to renewable energy. I'm sick and tired of the day fossil fuel companies greenwashing their way to sickening the planet. God gave us this planet to take care of, not to destroy. It's like getting a nice gift like a cake, then pushing it back into the face of the person who gave it to you. Except it's God's face you're squashing cake into. And that's just not nice. Unless he might smit you, as he has smitted clean energy show host Brian Stockton for all the masturbating he did as a teenager. Well said, Pope. Um, and a new document titled Laudate Diem, or Praise God, well, well titled document for the Vatican. The Pope criticizes, I'm sorry, Pope. Um, the Pope criticizes oil and gas companies for greenwashing new fossil fuel projects and calls for more ambitious, effort, more ambitious efforts in the West to tackle the climate crisis. In the landmark apostolic exhortation, a form of papal writing, Francis says that avoiding an increase of a tenth of a degree in the global temperature would already suffice to alleviate some of the suffering for many people. You know, he's right. Uh, yeah. He's not wrong. <laughs> That's why he's here with us on the show. So this is a follow-up to the Pope's 2015 rampage, I guess, uh, on climate change known as uh, Laudato Si, which lamented the exploitation of the planet and cast the projection of the environment as a moral imperative. Well done, Pope. Uh, when it was released, it was viewed as an extraordinary move by the head of the Catholic Church to address global warming and its consequences, and it's a decade later nearly. And the post message has taken on a new urgency. Yeah, he doesn't shy away from the responsibility of the oil and gas companies, and he shouldn't. I mean, uh, I wish he had the power to curse them, you know? This <laughs> <laughs> uh, is fun, guys. Yeah, it is. I don't know what to say other than at least one guy gets it, Brian. Yeah. He happens to be the Pope. It's kind of wrong in a lot of things. Sorry, Pope. When's lunch? I'm starving. Anyone up for pizza? Well, let's see. Yes, I'm always up for pizza. Yeah, uh, coming Another up. 40 minutes we should be out of here, Pope. Okay, so last week we reported on the farthest north solar farm ever that was in Norway. And we thought this was quite remarkable because it's up near the Arctic Circle. And you'd think, wow, that's crazy to put solar panels way up there. But you get almost 24 hours of daylight in the peak of summer. Of course, much darker uh, in the winter, but it, you know, it said in that story that they had not yet gone with uh, wind power. They were putting up solar panels and batteries first, and they were going to study the wind power or think about it. And I just had not particularly heard about uh, wind power in the north, but apparently it it is a thing. And I know a couple of years ago we talked about uh, the big power outages in Texas when they had that freak cold weather. It doesn't normally freeze in Texas. But it did a couple of years ago, and we talked about it here on the show, and some of their wind turbines did freeze because they were not prepared for this. So how cold and, did it get in Texas? Like a few degrees below free freezing? Yeah. It wasn't that severe. Yeah, but but it doesn't normally go below freezing. And so, you know, I know that we have wind turbines around here, and obviously it gets very cold. So, you know, I sort of figured, okay, well, there must be uh, a solution for this, but I hadn't really... Uh, thought about it. They, they did mention that the, the ones in Texas did not have the cold weather package. But anyway, so we have another story here. This is from CBC, and this is about a community in Sanakluak, Nunavut in northern Canada. This is very, very far north, and they're putting up one single wind turbine. This is a very small community, just a thousand people, but they're expected to produce enough power from this one wind turbine to uh, reduce their diesel consumption by half. So a lot of these remote communities are run by diesel generators, which you can imagine would be noisy, smelly, and expensive. But yeah, so we were talking earlier about, you know, power utilities and power utilities having to adapt to the kind of changing world. So one of the holdups with this was just kind of the way that power is normally generated. Like here in Canada, we typically have government monopolies for our power supply, for our power utilities. And this has worked generally really well over the last 100 years. 
but of course, if these these monopolies are not kind of willing to innovate, then things kind of slow down. So it took a bit of um, struggling to kind of figure out how this would work because this has not been done before. Our power utilities are often not used to uh, letting you know customers or other organizations supply the power, but they finally come to an agreement. So it is believed that this one uh, wind turbine is going to produce a one megawatt of power and they're going to put in a one megawatt uh, storage battery and this is going to reduce their diesel by 50%. This is for this community of a uh, thousand people. Uh, so this is great. It says here a lot of that has been mitigated in the last decade or two from the maturation of wind technology. You can get cold climate packages for wind turbines and you get heating within the blades. So because of that, they're able to offer wind turbines in the Arctic 12 months uh, out of the year. And I'm looking at it on a map, and this is in the middle of Hudson Bay, that bay that dips way down from the Arctic into cuts into northern Canada. And I would say it's uh, not quite as far north as Anchorage, but pretty close. And I'm guessing pretty moist and salty and uh, bloody cold and windy. Yeah, so that's fantastic because they have to ship the diesel in or take it in by plane, which is oh, no, crazy. not cheap at all. I mean, diesel is no. expensive as it is, but you know the way they get it there is a problem. And the really good news is that the data shows that wind is strongest in the winter, which is amazing because that's when the solar would be weakest. So I assume eventually they're going to add some solar panels, then the solar will work better in the summer and uh, the wind turbines better in the winter. The cool thing about uh, wind turbines in the in the winter is that the air is denser. So there's more molecules pushing that, you know, just like there's more resistance to your car going on a highway in the wintertime, there's more uh, power from a given wind um, because of the density of the air molecules. And um, shame on CBC for calling it a windmill. You know, that's a pet peeve of mine. Oh, yeah, that's right. I did notice that. They call it a windmill rather than a wind turbine. Yeah, it's not a windmill. People, <laughs> come on. Because uh, a windmill is a thing. A windmill is a, is a different thing. It mills with the wind, but it doesn't generate uh, electricity. But anyway. Pope Francis, do, do you have a comment about this story? I've been to the far north, and let me tell you, it's no place for brass monkeys. I have to put a heater in my big white hat. A heater in your big white hat. But, you know, it just yeah. goes to show Pope and Brian that... Um, you know, you can winterize things for very cold climates. I have a Nissan Leaf that has a heater in its battery, right? It, yeah. It knows to heat its battery. They they initially called that a cold weather package when they sent them to Canada and the northern U.S., but then they put them in all the cars. Um, but yeah, it just makes it work. So you use a little bit of the electricity to make it function. Yeah, it's just as simple as that, putting in a heater in the wind turbine. So yeah, obviously it's not going to run quite as efficiently if you've got to crank up the heater, but that's all you need to do to uh, stop it from freezing. I suspect it's a, it's a small fraction of the one mega, uh, one mega, <laughs> talking about megawatts, megabytes, uh, you know, and hard drives, but megawatts, a small fraction of that just to heat the blades to keep the ice off, which I yeah. assume is the reason why they do that because the ice. Yeah. And I wish I had that for my uh, solar panels on my house because they do get covered in snow and um, I'm not going to go out there to, to sweep them off. In Ireland, they have done something extraordinary, according to Bloomberg. They have said no to an LNG port, a port on the ocean to receive liquidified natural gas. Now, this is a thing that a lot of people said we're going to do in Europe because of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. But Ireland has said no. It's not good for the climate. Therefore, we're not doing it. So this is amid Europe's angst over energy security. Ireland has made one of the boldest moves of any nation on the continent in the name of climate action. It rejected a new fossil fuel import facility. Again, this is from Bloomberg. And the country's uh, planning authority last month refused a proposal for a liquefied natural gas uh, import terminal on the Shannon estuary and a related gas-fired power plant after taking into consideration policies outlined in Ireland's energy and climate action plan it calls for the country to reduce greenhouse gas emissions annually by 7% on average. Ireland is probably the first country to deny an LNG facility based on climate as opposed to local environmental opposition. 
Brian. Good news story. Yeah, no, that's quite interesting. Pope Francis? I want to give a shout out to my friends in Netherlands. They always treat me so nice when I'm there. They treat me like I'm the Pope or something. You know, Brian, if you went there, I think that our podcast listeners would treat you like the Pope. They treat me like the Pope? Well, that's go good there. to hear. Uh, okay, so in the United States, we often talk about the EV tax credits. So this is uh, seventy-five up to $7,500 uh, tax rebate on a new electric vehicle. And this is a huge, huge deal and part of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act from Joe Biden. But it's always been a bit of a sticking point that it's a, it's a tax credit, so you don't get the money up front, even though Biden kind of promised that from the beginning, that this would eventually turn into a uh, instant rebate. And uh, lo and behold, uh, this has happened. So uh, I'm reading the story here from Engadget. And uh, it says here that car dealers can give buyers an instant rebate for purchasing certain electric vehicles. And this will start in January 2024. And this is because of new guidance released by the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. They're the ones that kind of control the rules for these sorts of things. So the program is going to work basically like before. Uh, there are certain thresholds. So um, you're not going to get it if your uh, family has 300000 combined income or 150000 for uh, a single person. And of course, there's limits on the cost of the car. Super expensive cars are not eligible. But uh, this is a big deal because it's going to be a rebate that can be basically offered at the point of sale, um, which is going to make this a whole lot easier. It's kind of like, you know, an instant rebate rather than a, a mail-in rebate. We have that in uh, Canada, 5000 from the federal government instantly off. Um, but yeah, this is uh, something that sort of uh, disadvantaged uh, people who didn't have a lot of income. Uh, you know, people like my family may not have gotten the full 7,500 because we didn't make enough money to have that tax yeah. burden to begin it's with. It's a, a tax credit, so you have to owe 7,500 in tax, um, you know, to be eligible. Right. So now this applies to the people who need it most, which is the lower income people who are struggling to get into an EV. So hopefully that will get more of those people who are on the sidelines waiting. Yeah. And it's certainly uh, just uh, more convenient. Pope Francis? So I'm going to get a Tesla Model X and turn it into the new Pope Mobile. I've been talking to Elon Musk and he says it will be, will be ready in two weeks. Two weeks for the new Pope Mobile. You know, the Pope, uh, Your Holiness, you have received uh, uh, even a, a Nissan Leaf, I think, at one point, 10 years ago, I remember, to drive around the Vatican. Because you wanted to have, uh, you know, there's been lots of uh, European EVs uh, sent over to your facility there. So yeah. that's nice. Good for you, Pope. And, you know, some people uh, don't like that. That makes me very angry. Yeah, I, I imagine it would. Oh, speaking of uh, Pope Francis, we have um, uh, the mailbag. Let's step into the mailbag because I love me some mail. <laughs> We don't get enough mail. We need more mail. Here's the mail. Uh, Pope Francis, would you read this letter from Randy in Massachusetts, please? So glad you're feeling better. What a relief the new CPAP must be for you. I love the show. While well, I listen to a lot of climate clean energy podcasts, yours is the one I never miss. Keep or fast forward. Take care. Randy in Massachusetts. I hope it's not that kind of Randy. It's not. It's just, that's a, that's his name. Um, and thank you. I actually got a bunch of well wishes for my new improved health on various uh, forms of uh, social media where our channels are and comments and DMs and things. And thank you all for that. Yeah. Thanks, Randy. And, and thanks, Pope Francis, for reading that letter for us. It's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate clean energy and transportation. There's been a huge development on the future of EV battery labor. The UAW got uh, GM to agree to put battery workers under their master contract, which is uh, something I didn't think was going to happen, Brian, but they did it. And now uh, the people making that, because they were really worried that, you know, the Chinese companies were going to come in and make these gigafactories to make batteries, which is a major component of these new generations of cars, these new kinds of cars, unlike the engines. 
and that was going to take away labor. But now they've put them under that contract, which is good. Yes, the strike is still going on, but they are certainly happy with General Motors for uh, uh, agreeing to put the battery workers uh, under their master contract. Oh, and sad news this week. OPEC raises forecasts for global oil demand through 2045, even as the world tries to uh, shift away from fossil fuels to avert catastrophic climate change. That makes me very angry. And it's stupid, too. Like, it's... uh, what do you think, Brian? Like, uh, th- th- this seems batshit crazy to me. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I look at the source, I guess. I mean, uh, hopefully they're wrong. Everything's going to be fine. Uh, they see uh, petrochemicals and, you know, like airplane travel is supposed to take off over the next 30 years. I don't know why. I think there's going to be government policy that's going to discourage that until we get a cleaner way of traveling. So I wouldn't bet on any of this. Well, as we've reported on the show, there's lots of countries now that are above that 5% in new EV sales. So, you know, we're past some of these tipping points and it's really going to start to make a difference when people are using EVs rather than fueling up at the gas pump. So uh, hopefully OPEC will have to change their forecast. It's going to get really interesting to see what happens to gas cars because at a certain point of adoption, when there's, uh, fi- say, 50% of the fleet is electric, people aren't going to want their gas cars anymore because they're making paying more for them. And they're going to really realize that this is not the way to go. And the infrastructure yeah. is going to be there. And you and I have arrived at that sort of position uh, a long time ago. But of course, it's going to take uh, everyone else a long time to catch up. Yeah. And... OPEC is not one of them. Hyundai Motor Group is the latest automaker adopting the uh, Tesla charging adapter, the North American uh, charging standard, NACS. Still a few more to go, though. But yeah, basically a done deal, as as we've said before. This will be the new But that was a big one for me, because they are actually selling a lot of cars. They're not a premium car maker that they are putting out a lot of those cars. And that is a No, they're, you know... Aside from Tesla, Hyundai, Kia are making my favorite EVs right now. This uh, CS fast fact. This is from Bloomberg as well. If any, even if hydrogen electric passenger vehicle sales doubled every three years, by 2040, they'd only make up 0.2% of vehicle sales, which would do nothing for the environment, Brian. Nothing at all. Yeah. Not looking good for hydrogen. Uh, from Sky News, September 2023. September 2023 was the world's hottest September on record by an extraordinary margin, new data confirms. And here's another CES fast fact. Carbon capture and storage, CCS, is currently removing a tenth of a millionth of carbon a year out of the 60 billion tons per year in the world. Virtually, I'm removing more carbon with my uh, air purifier downstairs. (laughs) (laughs) That's about what's going on. Uh, which NFL team is the first to have its stadium powered by 100% wind, water, and solar? Electricity? Uh, Las Vegas Raiders. And they had their first carbon-free game on Monday Night Football. Good for yeah, them. Yeah, I think we talked about on the show a long time ago that the city of Las Vegas was trying to get all of their city operations to be uh, carbon neutral. So that's great. A large-scale sud- study with a sample of over 9,000 participants uh, showing links between uh, people's preference for authoritarianism. And believe it or not, Brian, they find these things, that there is a preference for authoritarianism. There's two kinds oh, really? of preferences, yes. There's a soft preference, preference where I want a, I want a boss. I want someone to, I want to subvert myself. The other one is they just want a strong person to uh, obliterate the world uh, with their own views. So there's two kinds of that. And they can... Find that. So there's a connection. If you have one of those authoritarianism sort of um, predispositions, you're also going to re- reject science and climate science. So there's links between them. If you do one, you probably can assume the other. And the 9,000 people is a pretty big study. Global electricity sector emissions could peak this year thanks to surging solar and wind, finds a new Ember Climate Report reported by The Guardian this week. And finally this week, Bloomberg EV analyst Colin McCracker uh, spoke this week about the myths of EVs being dirtier than combustion vehicles. This is continuing last year, or last week, pardon me, but we were talking about EV myths. Well, this is probably no one is smarter and knows everything about this area than Colin, and he's with Bloomberg. 
So uh, this is what he had to say. I'm going to play a clip. He was asked if EVs are cleaner on a grid 100% powered by coal. Absolutely, unequivocally, yes. Even on a 100% coal-powered grid. Yeah, if you have a 100% coal-fired grid, of which there are very few in the world, then the, the benefits on a life cycle basis are pretty marginal. It's sort of a 10, 15% benefit over a new, efficient internal combustion engine vehicle. But in most other places, it's a dramatic, dramatic reduction. So it might be 80%, 70%, depending on the country. You can think of it another way in terms of payback. So making a EV and battery and the components associated with it have a higher carbon footprint than making an internal combustion engine. In the US with current grid mix, you pay back that higher upfront CO2 burden in about a year and a half of driving. Now, in some cases, that's two years. In China, it's more like five or six years. But the point is that that vehicle will continue to get cleaner over its life cycle as long as we can keep getting the power infrastructure and grid generation mix cleaner. And we're doing that. I mean, you've done many shows on solar and on renewables. That's happening, that you're not going to derail that trend. There's going to be more and more renewables on the grid. And an internal combustion engine vehicle, when it rolls off the line, its emissions profile is locked in for the lifetime of its vehicle and slightly gets worse as the efficiency can degrade. Now, an EV isn't. You aren't blocking in the emissions. Its emissions profile changes over time and it will continue to get better. So there's a lot of ways you can make this look bad. You can say, oh, a vehicle only goes 100,000 kilometers or 60,000 miles in its lifetime. It doesn't. They go a lot more than that. You can take outdated studies on how much emissions there are from making a battery. You can look at old data on grid emissions intensity factors for a country and assume they say stay frozen for 15 years. But again, all those are just really bad methodological assumptions. And it really irks me and it irks anybody who works on this stuff to see those things come up over and over again. That's it for the lightning round. I thought that was a really good explanation and a definitive one because we keep hearing that over and over again. So cut that clip from our show, pass it to your friends. Uh, yeah. We'll share it on social media. That is a, a good explanation, Brian. That is great. Well, thank you so much for joining us and Pope Francis for our show this week. Please take the time to contact us, cleanenergyshow at gmail.com. You can leave a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash cleanenergyshow. And around social media, you can find us as Clean Energy Pod. Thank you both. It's been a real pleasure. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel, Pope. For special features, have a look at the Clean Energy Store. If you care to, I would like to see maybe a Pope hat, a Clean Energy Show Pope hat that the, His Holiness, the Pope Francis, could buy yeah. and wear, and they could just wear it around the Vatican. That would be just a great and, laugh. And with a solar panel on it that can heat your head in the cold weather. Brilliant idea. Maybe they need a fur, a fake fur, a faux fur on that thing. So if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app to get new episodes delivered every week. And I look forward to doing it all over again next week for a special international show from where? Well, you'll just have to tune in to find out. Yeah, we'll see you next week. Real fun, guys. Isn't it weird that I have a better grasp of English than James? <laughs>